from WSL Pure, this is One Ocean. Hey everyone, today we're going to get deep. That's right, today we'll learn how the deep ocean is full of mysteries, full of life, and still ripe for discovery. Hang with me for a minute here. If you had to take a guess at what the average depth of the ocean is, what would you say? Go ahead, think about it. As humans, we spend most of our time in shallow coastal water, but the ocean gets really deep. At its deepest point, it's almost seven miles deep. That's taller than Mount Everest. And so for that average across the whole ocean, it's actually around 2.2 miles or three and a half kilometers deep. That's deep. And after only 200 feet deep, there's rarely any light that penetrates. So we're talking about a ton of real estate that is pitch black, super cold, and under intense pressure. It's essentially like going to space, but right here on Earth. Point is, it's hard to get to, and it's an intense environment. But there are people who aren't daunted by any of this and are actively researching the greatest depths of our ocean to uncover new organisms, new geologic features, and developing technologies to do so. Today, we'll hear from Carly of Schmidt Ocean Institute, which is a nonprofit private foundation focused on deep sea research. We talk about the relationship of the deep sea to space, what kind of organisms you can find in the deep sea, and how what's below us is related to our favorite waves. Carly is super smart, really fun, and a stellar communicator on what is a pretty in-depth topic, excuse the pun, and we get into some mind-blowing stuff here. Admittedly, I actually think I say super cool like a hundred times this episode, so my apologies, but I didn't know what else to say. My mind was blown. Anyway, I highly recommend you check out the show notes on this episode because we're going to be linking to imagery of upside-down underwater lakes, hydrothermal vents, art painted by deep-sea robots, and more. All right, let's get to it. Carly Weiner of Schmidt Ocean Institute. How would you introduce yourself? You have a whole career in this. You're more than just your title. So how would you introduce yourself? Uh, that's a great question. Well, I, I'd say I'm an ocean lover, science communicator, mother, and friend. Nice. Yeah. Solid. Um, where are you from originally? Toronto, Canada. And you'll still, still hear some of those A's and boats that slide in there now and again. <laughs> totally cool. But we're here in Hawaii. How long have you been here? Uh, almost 16 years now. So. Whoa. Big move. How often do you get back home? Um usually once or twice a year i try to avoid the winters if i can and uh, <laughs> stay where the warm weather is <laughs> that's awesome um so your work with schmidt ocean institute what is schmidt ocean institute and and what is the work that you do there so schmidt ocean institute is a nonprofit founded by eric and wendy schmidt in 2009 and essentially we have a research platform uh falcor that travels around the world doing cutting edge ocean science and it's pretty fantastic it's got state-of-the-art research and uh research equipment and allows scientists to be able to explore our oceans not just on the surface but from surface to deep sea floor that's super cool um we're gonna we're gonna dive in there and you mentioned falcor real quick somebody uh my age might remember the reference the never-ending story so the this is the ship correct Yes, not the flying dragon. <laughs> so, but so, so your research vessel is named Falcor. It is. And in fact, it's actually named after the luck dragon from the fantasy novel or the movie, if you were an 80s kid, The Never Ending Story. And, and interestingly enough, on Falcor, we have a work boat and a safe boat named Atreyu and Aaron. And our ROV, so our submersible, is named ROV Sub Bastion, which is sort of a play on <laughs> words for Bastion, the main character. That's amazing. And is that just a passion of the Schmitz or is that, was there intention behind that in terms of communications? Was it to, to do something different and break through? Well, it, it was intentional. Um, Were you a part of the naming? I was not. Oh, okay. uh, Eric and Wendy, uh, that was a family book that they really enjoyed reading to their children. Interesting. So they just loved the name and thought it was fitting. Yeah. And actually on the walls or the halls of Falcor, there are some quotes from the book that are very applicable to what we do. Very cool. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So tell me more about what, what you do. Tell, tell me about this work because I feel like it's so important and yet most of us have no idea really how to translate it because it's like you are on this crazy research vessel in the deep sea and it's cool, but why does it translate? So uh, one of the things that's really unique, I think, is that we're not out there just doing research, but we're communicating about it and sharing the work that we're doing with the world. And it's often work that 
people don't think about in their daily lives, but it's so critical. I mean, we're looking at not just sea surface, but all the way down to the seafloor. And so exploring some areas of the ocean that most people will never see and bringing light and perspective to that. So you can follow some of our work that we're doing and be able to go explore hydrothermal vents or deep sea mounts with coral reefs that you didn't even know existed at these depths. I mean, for some people, what is a hydrothermal vent really quickly? What is a deep sea mount? So uh, that's also a great question. Most of, most of our listeners are probably surfers, I'm assuming, and most of us spend our time at the surface. Uh, so we're not deep sea. So let's start. At wh- the, what are we missing? Yes. Let's start at the beginning here. I mean, if you're sitting on your board in between a set, looking out at the water, you might be wondering what's underneath the water. And, and you're familiar with Um, The shallow corals probably either from a reef cut that you've had when you've eaten it on a wave or, um, you know, some of the what we call coral reef environments. But there are corals that extend deeper than human capabilities can go. And that's where technology comes into play, where after you hit some of the diving levels, you can look at submersibles, underwater robotics to explore these environments. And we have corals that amazingly can survive in very low light colder waters and as you go even deeper because normally so sorry just to make sure we're getting all this so normally corals are in that sort of first like 30 meters or so right we think of them as being shallow water to get sun for photosynthesis right exactly if you're thinking about your traditional stony corals or bright colored corals As you go deeper, you get these unique corals that are adapted to these different environments. And in fact, when you see coral jewelry, which, you know, isn't really uh, something we want to be promoting, absolutely not. But the coral that people wear is some of those deep sea corals. You get whip corals, bamboo corals. So some of these deeper corals that exist in environments that we can't see or that we visit ever or very often. Interesting. Very cool. And how are they surviving down there? Do we know? Well, they're adapted for these environments. And so we still don't know a lot about these deep sea corals in what they call the mesophotic zone or the midwater zone. Um, so you're we'll thinking midwater zone. Yeah, yeah. We're not we're not talking shallow and we're not talking super deep here. But these corals, what some of the scientists that come on Falkor do is try and understand their connectivity. For example, we had a expedition this past summer in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands or the Papahanaumokuakea Camry. National Monument. Wow, you're good at nailing that. I always struggle <laughs> to say experience. it. I always struggle to say it. Okay, one more time. Papahanaumokuakea. How many times can you say it quickly? Uh, let's not try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, back to the expedition. But they were trying to get samples of these corals on seamounts to understand their connectivity. So they're gen- using genetics to see how they relate to corals elsewhere in the main Hawaiian islands or the Hawaiian archipelago or the rest of the Pacific. We still don't know the flow of things, where corals are going and how they reproduce. And why that's important is if you protect an area or don't protect an area and you have harvesting or deep sea mining or um, rare earth mineral collection and you destroy a habitat, is that habitat going to come back? And being able to look at genetics and connectivity will help answer that question. Super cool. You mentioned deep sea mining there. And I feel like I read an article recently about all the deep sea mining around metals for batteries. Is that correct? Yeah, you like how I kind of slipped in that controversial point there, huh? (laughs) Sorry, Sorry to pick up on that one. Uh, but yeah, it's it's an important topic. It is an important topic. And um, yeah, batteries, cell phones, primarily. They're people. We, we all have one or two of those. We do. And people are looking to the deep sea as a possible resource for some of these earth minerals needed for batteries and such. There hasn't been a lot of that that's gone on so far. However, there are several communities and islands in the Pacific that have created permitting systems to allow that to to happen. And what a lot of the science community wants to know is how is this going to impact 
these deep sea environments that we don't know a lot about. And not to confuse it, it doesn't have to do with corals per se. It has to do with some of these manganese nodules you find on seamounts or some of the minerals coming from hydrothermal vents, which is something I mentioned earlier. And hydrothermal vents are actually cracks in the bottom of the ocean where hot water is coming up and mineral deposits start to happen. And you develop these chimneys, essentially, with hot water that's meeting the ocean water. And you get an entire ecosystem that's developed around these hydrothermal vents that actually use the chemicals instead of light to produce food and energy. So instead of, you know, the traditional photosynthesis that you think about in terms of light and energy, it's actually using chemicals in a process called chemosynthesis. I won't say that again, I promise. <laughs> um, so I remember this from my childhood because I am I was very fortunate growing up on Cape Cod and being near Woods Hole and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and all the research that went on down there. Dr. Robert Ballard doing you know uh, research with Alvin and then the Jason. And as a kid, I remember the hydrothermal vents discovery being a big part of our science curriculum in school. And I always thought that was so amazing. I mean, it's mind blowing. And for people listening, uh, we'll link to maybe a video or two that you can send us uh, for the show notes. But you have these whole communities of the tube worms and the crabs that go around them. And I mean, it's just a whole thing out of nowhere. I mean, otherwise, the deep sea, oh, I shouldn't say this, it's not void of life. It's just so dark and desolate and cold and high pressure. And it's crazy that life can even exist down there, let alone have these massive communities. You have to give mad respect to the animals that live in these environments. I mean, they're dealing with cold temperatures, pressures that equate to the equivalent of like 50 jumbo jets on top of your head. And I mean, trying to make a living as an animal in these areas is very difficult. And they, they've adapted to this environment, which is super cool, but they're not well known because you don't have access to that. And in fact, we didn't know about hydrothermal vents until the late 70s. So science, in terms of historical science, we know very little about these areas because we've only had the technology to access them for maybe 20, 30 years. And so it's kind of fascinating because we spend a lot of money on space research, uh, I see you nodding and smiling. <laughs> Am I hitting on a, a sore so spot or a, a positive spot? I mean, I guess m my point is that we, we spend a lot on space research and yet there's so much of the earth and the ocean that we haven't explored yet and don't know anything about. You would be hard pressed to find anything in science that doesn't start off with, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the deep ocean. But the question that I think is really important to highlight is not that we, we know more about the moon, but why do we know more about the moon than we do about the deep sea? And interestingly, a lot of NASA scientists are looking to the deep sea to better understand space. So we're kind of going into our inner center or inner inner world to understand the outer worlds and a lot of these extreme life forms and extreme environments creating or developing technology and instruments to study these deep sea areas can also be applied to studying space. Whoa, that's cool. I mean, as a diver, you know, not uh, an, uh, not someone who dives that often, but as a scuba diver, it's always it's always felt to me like the closest thing to space that I'll ever feel in my lifetime. I mean, you go on a night dive and it's pitch black and it's cold and you're kind of floating around zero gravity, essentially, when you're neutrally buoyant. And it does just feel like space. And, and I think what's fascinating is you talk about those creatures at those depths, that's alien life form. Like we talk about looking for alien life forms in outer space we have them here on earth that have evolved over millions of years and they're in these incredible organisms that can do so much cool stuff i don't know if i'm i don't know if i'm just nerding out here but that's what it feels like to me is we have all this incredible life right here well i will join you in that nerd adventure in saying <laughs> that i mean the stories of the scientists on our ship falcor i mean you can't write this stuff it's like straight out of science fiction the things we see and the interesting science that's being give us a done. couple examples Perfect example. We had a cruise recently in the Pescadero Basin. Where's that? Um, that's in Mexico, in the Gulf of California. And we had scientists find this uh, upside down lake, okay, which was essentially a hydrothermal vent area that okay. was spewing out really hot water and was pooling under this ledge when it met the regular ocean water and created literally, it almost looked like this metallic upside down crazy, I'll, I'll send you a video so you can, you can match it because it's absolutely absolutely the most breathtaking thing you've ever seen. And I felt like I was watching an episode of Stranger Things and I was in the upside down, like literally <laughs> looked the exact same way. So, I mean, there are a lot of parallels between these science fiction stories and the deep sea. That's insane. What else? What's another good one? What's another good discovery? 
Well, in 2014, in the Mariana Trench, for those of you that don't know, is one of the deepest, is the deepest spot in the entire um, ocean floor and world. How, and how deep is it? And how, how much deeper is it than, uh, I, I believe, how many Everest fit inside of? Right? Oh, I don't it? know the exact uh, statistic of how many Everest, but it's deep. It's it's taller lengthwise than Mount Everest. Right. It's 11,000 meters deep. Um, and Challenger wow. Deep is that deepest spot in the Mariana Trench. Wow. And so we were there in 2014 with Falcor doing some research on these vent areas. And we came across a fish at 8,130 meters or something along those depths, which is... Just cruising along. Just pretty deep for a fish. And at that point, it was believed that that was the deepest depth that any fish had ever been seen. That record has since been broken, but still pretty neat for a fish. Wow. And this fish was not like a typical reef fish that our surfers would see, like a yellow tang or a parrot fish. Um, those are beautiful in their own way. But this ghost fish, we titled it a ghost fish because it looked like a ghost. Uh, very translucent, white colored body with, you know, these I wouldn't call it fins, but, you know, hovering. And again, I can show you an image to share so you can see what this... There are going to be a lot of good show notes for this episode. Yeah, ghost fish looks like. But pretty incredible because not only was it a new species discovery, but it was also something that showed that there is life that challenges what we believe already. And we still, you know, don't know a lot about the ocean in fact, in a time where we have an extinction crisis, where species are disappearing at a rate that's never been seen before, in the ocean, we still don't even know what we have. And how can you protect something that you don't know exists? Yeah, that's a really good point. Does Schmidt Ocean and your team, do you do advocacy as well? Or how do you take your knowledge and share it with the world? Because that's your role, right? It's communicating what you find. So, you know, uh, writ large, Schmidt Ocean is out there discovering incredible new organisms and doing this research. How do you then take that out to the world? So I think we do this in several ways. And the first way is that we're producing evidence-based research. So we're trying to address ocean issues using science. Um, and in a world where there's a lot of fake news and a lot of, you know, what? questionable, let's what? say, sources, <laughs> I think getting back to the basics is very important. And the basics is what we do. We're looking at baseline work. So understanding what we have, characterizing these environments that we don't know, and being able to create information to better apply to management, to conservation, to understanding how our earth is changing, how our oceans are warming. So you, you mentioned the word baseline, mm -hmm. baseline information. And I wanted to explore that a little bit because you know we live in such a rapidly changing world where things are changing before our eyes, which is really not how it's supposed to happen on a geologic time scale, but we're seeing things change so rapidly. But if we don't have a baseline to start from, we don't know what we're dealing with. So a great example that we explored in another episode with Ethan Estes was around fisheries. And so the stock that we might think is this is that stock is actually significantly depleted from what it was 100 years ago, mm -hmm. pre-industrial times, et cetera. And that's a shifting baseline. And if we're basing policy decisions off of incorrect information or a bad baseline, then <laughs> you know, you're, you're starting with bad information. So crap in, crap out, kind of, to speak really bluntly. But you know, how, how are you addressing that? It's just trying to get a baseline. What are the baseline measures that you're trying to uh, tackle right now with Falcor's research that will sure. help us make great policy decisions? That's a really good point. And first of all, I will say it's not me doing the research. I want to give uh, proper respect and acknowledgement to the incredible scientists that we have on board. I'm just in awe of what they do and get to share what they're doing. I can't take credit for any of the work that they do. Similarly, I can't take credit for any of the good surfing on the WSL tour. <laughs> My surfing is terrible. <laughs> Everyone else does the good surfing. Anyway, yeah. So but, more, more about what the research is that you're doing that you bring up a really interesting point about these shifting baselines, right? If they're changing so fast, how do we know a true baseline? And to be the honest answer is sometimes we don't. And we just got to work with the best available information that we have. One of the things unique to Schmidt Ocean Institute is we're trying to fund research that's doing something a little bit different that thinks outside the box and is using technology to advance the field. So looking at ways of being able to characterize the ocean or get these observations on a faster, less expensive, broader scale, which is really important because the ocean's pretty big yeah. and there's not enough people 
to study it or enough ships to study it. And so we've brought on to our ship a lot of scientists from around the world that are developing tools and unique ways to explore using technology. So swarm robotics, which basically means having multiple different underwater robots to characterize and adapt themselves in real time using artificial intelligence to kind of look at what they're studying and ad adapt in situ or in real time to get the information that we need. So that is something that's going to really change the field of oceanography, speed up the pace, allow us to be able to capture those baselines at a point where at least we're getting it now before it changes, you know, more significantly. The other thing that's really Hang interesting. On, can we go back into the swarm robotics? Because in my mind, I go to like YouTube videos I've seen of these little drones that swarm around and actually just make me really scared for the future <laughs> of these little <laughs> robots that can swarm like bees and 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 solve problems and things. Are you talking about little like, mini submersibles that can actually operate on their own? Because many current submersibles are all tethered, right? So this is where we get into the AUV versus ROV. Um, so I don't want to get into the weeds and get too technical here. Okay. ROV is a remotely stands for remotely operated vehicle, and that's something that's tethered to a ship with an umbilical. So in understandable language, basically there's a cable that runs from the ship to this robot that goes underwater and it provides it with electricity and communication so that people can drive or pilots are on the ship moving this ROV in the water around so they can do sampling, do video. Um, Sebastian, which is our ROV, goes to 4,500 meters depth on Falcor, has two robotic arms and is very modular so that each science party that comes on the ship can adapt it for what they're doing because we don't do the same science twice. So like adapt the arms, like literally go, go gadget sort of swap in tools or, or what? Uh, yes, and more. <laughs> so we actually have had scientists where they've tried new hands essentially on those robotic arms to capture or to sample species that are a little more delicate. So we had a group that used something called the squishy fingers, which were essentially like sponge fingers that would grab right yeah, this, the, the, the samples that they were looking for. But also so that you can have different sensors that you can add and remove on the vehicle and things like, you know, taking core samples from the bottom of the ocean. So, you know, those sediments, the muds, what bacteria, what minerals, what things are living in there. That's an area that people study. You wouldn't even think to you know, look there. Water sampling. So just even knowing the chemical components of what's in the water. So cool. Hey, a quick break from our conversation to give a shout out to Outer Known. They sponsor this podcast because they care about the ocean too. That's shown in their clothing, which is all made from organic cotton, recycled and regenerated fibers, doesn't use a lot of water in the process or dyes, and is made by people who are paid a fair wage. I love their stuff. I'm rocking an Outer Known t-shirt that my wife gave me right now. It's super comfy, stylish, durable, and I feel good knowing that it was made responsibly. Outer Known was actually founded by pro surfer and 11-time world champion Kelly Slater, who was determined to create a clothing company who made clothing responsibly. And you don't have to be a surfer to wear Outer Known. It's really stylish. They have great threads for men and women. And you can go to OuterKnown.com today and enter the code OCEAN at checkout and you'll get 25% off your full price order. That's OuterKnown.com, O-U-T-E-R-K-N-O-W-N.com. And remember to use the code OCEAN at checkout for 25% off. Check them out today, OuterKnown.com. And don't forget, promo code OCEAN for 25% off. Now back to our conversation. You were going somewhere else before yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us in all different directions here, but I promise <laughs> I'll always come back. Um, <laughs> so the other thing that's really neat in terms of talking about baselines is scientists can actually look into our past. So um, they're time magicians, if you will, um, being able to take drowned corals or old coral skeletons. And just like rings of a tree that you count to, to do aging, you can look at historical sea level or you can use radiocarbon data to understand chemical components of the ocean 25, 50 years ago. And so you're able to look backwards with some of the samples that we do and collect. And in fact, we have many scientists that come on the ship that do this. That's so cool. And it's so important to to understand where we've been, right? To get back to that baseline. You know, one of the coolest experiences I've had in this journey being a part of WSL Pure is uh, getting to go to the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Oh, yeah. And um, Dr. Peter Domenical is one of our, you know, kind of board members and supporters for Pure. And I got to see uh, they have the Earth Core samples. I mean, they have 
I don't know, I think it's almost a hundred years of earth core samples, thousands of them taken from around the world. And you get to see like geologic time in these earth core samples and they can understand all the layers, you know, with these two meter samples from everywhere. And I just kind of, I just remember that experience being so powerful. And I was kind of blown away by looking at that. It was really cool to make it visible. And so it was very tangible. So I, I guess my question to you is how in your role are you communicating this out to the world? How do you communicate this really sciencey work and how do you get it out to be able to understand? Um, now, obviously, you can do that you know, in the government level. You're trying to influence policies. You're just trying to get that message through. But are you, are you doing more outreach to the broader public? And, and you know, how do you get them to care and understand? We get a chance to work in some of the world's most remote areas doing research that a lot of people don't get to do. And that's important to be able to share it with the communities globally, but also the communities where we work. And we try really hard to do that by offering tours of Falkor. So when we come to a community, being able to bring people on board so that they can see the tools that we're using, we can talk about the science and engage them in that tangible way that you talked about, where you can really feel it and see it and understand why it's important. For those that can't come on board, we try to bring the expeditions to them. And Schmidt Ocean Institute is not unique in this. There are several exploration groups that do this work where we live stream our dives with ROV Sebastian. So you can so see cool. literally what the scientists are seeing in real time. So like the ROV that's deep underwater, 4,500 meters deep, is live streaming to the world so you can see what you're doing. You literally can go out surfing on the surface of the water and then come back shore turn on YouTube and be able to see 4,500 meters down from that and, and look at these crazy unique life forms that you wouldn't be able to see anywhere else. That's so cool. It's so cool. So how often do you do that? It depends on the science that we're doing on Falcor. As I said, every expedition is different, but I would say we do that pretty often. We're averaging eight to nine expeditions per year. Every That's that's not insignificant. It's not. And we try to be as productive as possible with Falcor. So we're out doing research as much as we can. And all of our dives are live, live streamed. So we, Sebastian, we built in 2016. It was designed and built in-house in just under two years. And since then, We've had over 300 dives. So we, it, you know, we've done a lot in the wow. last couple of years. Wow. That's so impressive. I mean, because these are, these are very expensive, I imagine, pieces of technology that you're building. And it's not trivial to put them together and put them out on a serious dive. It's not, but the reward is so important in, in what we're collecting. And it also allows scientists who maybe don't get the opportunity to go out to sea to be able to use that footage. Um, we try to double down on that footage that we're getting so that not only the scientists can use it, but students can learn from it, make yeah, it available you, you to anybody. You it all, right? You, it's all public. That's so cool. I think it's it's great that you make that public and, and enable people to leverage it for whatever message they want to use, which is really cool. The other thing that I do think makes us unique is we have a dedicated multimedia correspondent on every expedition that we have. And essentially what that is, is someone who can help tell the story, who's collecting video footage, who's collecting imagery of the science that's taking place so that the scientists can focus on the science. And that person takes interviews, we put them together, and every expedition we do, we have a weekly video that shows you what's happened that week on Falcor, you know, really focusing on the science, the technology, and why it's important, why people should care. Super cool. Now, what about the artist program? Yeah, let's get into that. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> so this is a true passion of mine. I absolutely love this program that we have. And, and it I think it's one of the most unique programs um, that's being done right now. It's an artist at sea program where we bring artists onto Falcor and consider them part of the science party. So they're there working alongside of the scientists, even though they have no research experience whatsoever, but learning about the science and having the scientists explain to them in a way that they haven't had to do before. And what's really special about it is we've had feedback from scientists after participating at sea with these artists saying, you know, this was such a great opportunity. It really made me think about my science in a different way. It allowed me to uh, have a bit more creativity in the work that I'm doing. And it's a pairing that you would think is unlikely, but there's actually a lot of commonality between scientists and artists in, in what they're creating and how they're thinking about things. And so it's a really interesting pairing and way to communicate the science 
in a approachable way that will engage a whole new different audience. That's so cool. So, you know, I've seen some of the works that have come out of this. Some of them you literally have. Didn't you have one person try to paint with the arm of one of the ROVs? Yeah, we had an artist, Lily Simons, who does deep sea painting. You know, she she does a focus on deep sea organisms and actually used the arms on Sebastian, our ROV, to paint imagery of what they saw in the deep sea. And so she's essentially driving the ROV then to paint, right? Yep. That's so cool. (laughs) How'd it come out? It turned out really, really well. Actually, all of the art that we create on board um, is put onto our online gallery on our website, on the Schmidt Ocean website. And we have all different types of artists doing unique things. We're not just trying to pigeonhole one type of artist. We've had composers that have taken data and made um, new arrangements. We've had fiber artists uh, yarn bombing Falcor and doing uh, <laughs> the first crocheted CTD data set. I mean, we've got <laughs> uh, everything. Yarn, that you can imagine. Yarn bombing is a term I didn't know until five seconds ago. It wasn't a term I knew either until this <laughs> artist came on board. I'm going to do a deep dive Google search on yarn bobbing later. <laughs> um, so what are some of the challenges of your work? It sounds really cool. It sounds awesome. Super fun. You have a great passion for it. What are the challenges of this, of, of the work of this research and of your role in it? I think quantity is the biggest challenge to all of it in terms of there's so much to do. There's not enough time to do it all, um, not just for me personally, but for the the earth. You know, there's so much to understand and explore and, you know, science that needs to be done. And you don't have enough resources and time to be able to do all of it. And I think that's the challenge we all face. It's funny. I recently was at the Pacific Marine Environment Laboratory and working with NOAA, and it was a stakeholder meeting around their next five-year plan. And you had all these different scientists and nonprofits and groups who leveraged that data, and they were asking for our input on, you know, what are the biggest priorities? What data do you need? What? How can we help you do more? And I found it really interesting how so many of the groups couldn't even prioritize. They're like, we need all of this right now. (laughs) Uh, You know, you have very senior researchers who are like, I need that, I need this, I need this, I need this. If we're going to understand that, I need that. And I tried to challenge them coming at it from, you know, my previous experience in startups and being a nonprofit guy, being more focused of like, you got to prioritize, you get like three things, you know, and really you get one thing as a priority at any given time. And the sense of urgency I felt from them was so tangible that it really speaks to the urgency of the problem of we need this data, we need this information at a time when unfortunately science has been under attack. I would say that's absolutely true. And the sad truth of the matter is it is urgent time and there's multiple needs that are taking place. We're shifting, we're changing our planet at a pace that is unprecedented. And we don't really understand that impact. And how do you communicate that? And how do you share that in a way that's going to motivate people, but not scare them enough that, you know, they're just going to be like, well, it's hopeless. Let's let's walk away, call it a day and sorry for the next generation, you know. And I think that's also the biggest challenge to science, science communicators. We walk this fine balance between conveying hope, but also being realistic about the problem. I think that's a really, really poignant statement right there. The balance between hope and being realistic. I find myself challenged by this often because I am optimistic naturally, and I do think there's a lot to be excited about, but you can't ignore the reality of the situation. And it's this fine balance, but if we're to engage more people in our movement, we want them to know that there is something they can do and they can be a part of this. And so we have to be optimistic. We have to remain you know, vigilant and courageous. And, and lately, courageous is the word that I've been latching onto. I really love Dr. Kate Marvel's essay uh, where she talks about we need courage, not hope. You know, hope is is great and important, but courage is kind of that bravery in the face of the unknown that we need to have and take these steps forward. I don't know if that resonates with you at all. It completely does. I love that. And I think there are bright spots that are taking place that we really need to embrace. First, that we have technology at our fingertips now that we've never had before. And so we have more information, more ways to understand, and more ways to communicate that 
than ever in the history of the world. And so that puts us in a place that is a positive way that we can grow a collective interest in what's happening and addressing the problems. It's an exciting time to be a part of this. I mean, if, if you want to be a part of this, there's a role for you. There's a role for everyone in this, I think, you know, in your local community or as part of an organization. And so on that, I'm curious, how did you get into this role? Because I feel like it's a pretty unique spot where you have this deep sort of science, you know, knowledge and background, but you in this communications role, at least growing up, I, I didn't see myself becoming a scientist, but I would have loved this kind of a role of communicating the science. Like that's the part that I really could get behind. I'm like, I didn't know that was even a thing. So a little bit more about your background of how does someone from Toronto, Canada get into ocean communications and marine communications out in Hawaii and for deep, the deep sea? So some of it is fortuitous and I feel extremely lucky. I really do feel like I have the best job in the world. For some reason, it was innate. Since I've been three, I wanted to be a marine biologist. I had no exposure to dolphins or whales or oceans <laughs> or sea stars or anything growing up in Toronto. I mean, maybe some melted snow and uh, <laughs> that was about it. I had um, snowbird grandparents, so got to go to the beach once a year in Florida and, and maybe that was some early exposure. But it was really actually too expensive to go to school in the States. And so I stayed in Canada, in Ontario, which, you know, is not known for its marine biology programs and uh, <laughs> ended up doing communications. And this was before before science communications was really a growing field. And then later felt that I just had to be true to the calling that I had and and went and did my master's and PhD more focused on ocean work and um, ocean science work. And it kind of just landed me in some amazing opportunities. I interned first um, in Hawaii for a summer in between my undergraduate and graduate degree. It's a solid internship. It was actually how I first learned to surf. And I was like, oh, I don't have to live with snow. I can surf all the time. This is lovely. Uh, let's do this. And I never left after pretty much I did my master's, came out here to do my research in Hawaii. And from there, I've been really lucky to be able to work with incredible scientists and incredible communicators for several different organizations, including the University of Hawaii, which led me to Schmidt Ocean Institute. And I've been there for five years now, a little more than five years. Super cool. You know, I have a lot of friends who would joke around and say that surfing ruins their lives or ruin their lives because it makes you this like flaky person who never wants to schedule a meeting because you want to keep your schedule open for surfing. And they're saying it because actually surfing saved them in some way and they love it and it's a huge part of their lives, but they often joke around that surfing ruined their lives. In this case, it sounds like it hooked you and the islands hooked you and the ocean hooked you, but you always had that passion. I've loved the ocean, but yeah, to be quite honest, and my husband will tell you this, I, you can't take the Toronto out of me. I am like a very A-type organized person <laughs> in everything that I do. So you've maintained that regard in spite of surfing. Interesting. What are some What are some tips you have for people who are looking to get into this field or who want to, you know, pursue a path like yours? You know, there. I, I feel like it's a time now where uh, we're engaging so many, so much of the youth in this, and they're thinking about what's my career and how do I become a part of this movement and and it, we need more people in science. So I don't know, what are some tips you have? Well, I think the most important thing is to like what you do. And so really find that niche area that excites you and, and don't give up, you know, be courageous, keep pa be passionate and be aggressive, you know, study it, offer yourself for internships. The best thing you can do is know people in the industry that you want to work in, right? And and so having firsthand experience is the best way to get to know people. And then what about tips on communicating? Like, do you have any high level tips on communicating science that, you know, you're applying it to deep sea science, but for any of those other people out there who are working on campaigns in their local community, you know, what are your high level sort of communication frameworks or tips or advice that, that people can put into their daily, daily practice? Or even people who are just trying to say, how do I explain climate change to somebody without getting in a fight about it over the dinner table with my uncle or whatever? <laughs> Uh, that's challenging <laughs> in, in the current climate that we're in. But um, I would say it's really important to be evidence-based and to have evidence to back your statements. You know, it's easy to throw feelings in there. And people get really passionate about what they're doing, which is really good to to be. It's good to be passionate, but it's also good to have evidence to back what you're talking about. And I think that is something that often gets overlooked. And to also connect with people on ways that is going to make them care. You know, we every science 
project that we communicate, the first question we ask is, why should we care? Why is that important? Why is someone farming in the middle of Nebraska going to care about the deep sea and the ocean? We have to make those connections. And I think that is um, the most critical piece to science communication is making people care. And why does that farmer in Nebraska care? Well, um, it depends on the expedition, but if we're talking about the oceans in general, I mean, the oceans are responsible for half of our oxygen. Most people think, you know, okay, trees are important, which they are, but the ocean produces more oxygen than trees. Do you like eating fish? Do you like food? You know, some people in North America, it's not going to affect them that much, but there are many people all over the world that rely on the ocean as their primary protein source. At the current rate we're fishing it, there's not going to be a lot of protein for people in the future. And so that's another reason why we should care. Yeah. I mean, I think I'll, I could stop at oxygen every other, every other like breath, breathing. <laughs> every other breath, pretty important. I think that's a good reason for everybody to care. But I also think, you know, for those living inland, the Nebraska farmer, for example, you know, the ocean regulates our weather. Let's right. speak to our audience. You like surfing? You like the ocean? Yeah. Currents are really important. Coral reefs are really important. These are all things we need to take into consideration. Yeah. Now, do you surf much? Still, quite honestly, you're, you're pretty busy. You, you also, you're a mom. I will say, my surfing has taken a brief hiatus <laughs> uh, due to a very demanding two year old and job. But it's something that I would love to revisit soon. And my love for the ocean still remains very strong. And I'm able to get in the ocean where I live, which I feel very fortunate to do. Well, that's awesome. And you're on the road quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, w we met originally in Boston at MIT at their um, all hands on deck event a couple of years, a year ago, a year ago or so. But I, I, you're on the road, right? Um, yeah, I get to do a lot of traveling with what I do. Where Falcor, our research vessel goes, we tend to do a lot of outreach and community events. And that's really important to engage the areas that we're working in. And so I have the pleasure of being able to set those up and coordinate them. I'm really looking forward actually to this year in 2020, Falco is going to be doing work all across Australia's coastline, uh, which is a really important project because they have no science ROV. And so we're bringing our science ROV to explore some of these canyons and deep coral reefs that have never been seen before. Whoa. So I didn't realize that. I knew you were going to Australia, but I didn't realize there's, so there's no deep sea ROV operating in Australia? No science ROV currently operating. And so there are areas that haven't been explored before that need to be. When you say science ROV, you mean the difference being that there are maybe other ROVs that are doing like exploratory drilling work and stuff like that or, or what? There are uh, private ROVs for oil and gas companies in uh, Australia. But from what I understand, and the data they collect is not always available to the public. So what we're doing is coming to Australia with our science ROV, exploring areas that haven't been seen before and making that data available to the science community. Wow. So what are some of the areas that you're going to touch down in, in Australia? Um well, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> we have some really interesting stuff taking place. So in the first quarter of 2020, Falcor will be doing several expeditions on the Western Australia coastline, um, starting with Bremer Canyon and several canyons there that host a lot of deep sea corals. And then we'll be making our way to Cairns. And we'll be doing some interesting work there. Across the northern route? Uh, yeah, we're going okay. the northern route. And then we'll also be looking at microplastics on one expedition in July, which will be really interesting seeing where they go from the surface to sediments on the seafloor and how they get incorporated into our marine ecosystems. Wow, that's super interesting. I, I feel like that's an area that still has so much research to be done. You know, we think about microplastics floating on the surface and the, the patch and everything, but the reality is that it's deep in the water column. Uh, it's everywhere. And, and what happens to those big pieces when they break down into tiny, tiny, minute pieces and get absorbed into you know, our food chain. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If you can make that connection and report back for us, that'd be great. Well, I again won't personally, but I certainly will communicate what the scientists are doing. You as an org. <laughs> there you go. And then um, towards the end of the year, we'll also be doing some technology development, which I've also mentioned is very important to Schmidt Ocean. And so we have several science groups coming on to Falcor that are going to be looking at ways to advance the field um, using robotic systems. We have a group coming on a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary group at the end of the year that will be looking at 
in situ or camera lasering system that takes place in the water looking at soft-bodied organisms like jellyfish. Whoa, super cool. Explain that again. Hang on. <laughs> so explain, so trying to understand the soft-bodied organisms for what purpose? What is the why? So it's it, allowing them to look at organisms without having to remove them from the environment that they're in. And that's important because when you take an organism, especially in the deeper part of the ocean, out of its environment, it's going to shift. It's not going to be in the environment that it's used to. And so it's not going to give you true information. Um, being able to get genetic samples from these organisms is really important. Um, circling back to that connectivity, understanding what's there, and also being able to image them at the same time to a fine resolution will really help us not only to characterize new species and different organisms, but also understand how they function in their own world or environment. Yeah. And I mean, the the connection of these species to our environment is so, so important. I, you know, recently um, that article around whales and the whole carbon cycle and the role that whales play in the carbon cycle has kind of caught fire. And this year you have the uh, Convention on Biodiversity. And so that's going to be a big topic that we're talking about. So it's super important that you're able to touch on that research and also just jellyfish in general, because I've read a few things that say that in the future with a warming ocean, we're just going to have more and more jellyfish fish spawning everywhere and so that's not really an ocean i want to surf in <laughs> i think most people i mean my wife uh, I, I can remember one time when there was like a moon jelly bloom on the east coast and we were about paddling out and it was like every single stroke you were just putting your hand into jellyfish and she's like ah, ah, ah. and she doesn't scare easily she's just like what is this what's going on it was pretty it's definitely it's not an gross. ocean yet <laughs> <laughs> you wanted be surfing in. Yeah. Um, what else is going on at Schmidt Ocean? What, el what else do you have coming up? What else do you want to share? Uh, we're really excited about Australia to be able to bring Falcor back there. We were last there in 2015 and um, being able to dive in new environments, see new things, maybe discover new species that we haven't before is something that we're very, very excited about. Um, we've had a really productive year this year too, doing some amazing research all over the globe. Right now, Falcor is in Fiji. So in December, Falcor has been looking at basically the sea surface microlayer. So we're talking about a very, very thin slice of the top of the ocean that meets the air and looking at those exchanges or interactions with new tools. So they've developed these unmanned aerial vehicles, which are essentially mini planes. And why that's important is these new planes essentially have a payload or capability to have greater equipment and sensors on them than they've ever had before and have never been flown uh, autonomously on and off a moving research vessel. And so that's allowing scientists to not only see with better resolution, but expand their footprint when they're out at sea doing research. And that top layer of the ocean is a really important one to study as much as the deep sea. And like I said, we, we got so much to do here <laughs> because the satellites can only provide a certain resolution, right? We can see some things about our ocean using satellite data, but this provides a fine scale that you can't get with those satellite images. And they're looking at things like cyanobacteria blooms, right? So that's very important in terms of that affect entire fisheries. So if you're able to predict and understand those movements and those blooms, that's going to be able to provide a lot of information for not just science communities, but fishing communities and other m ocean managers as well. Wow, that's super cool. Anything else that you're doing or what are you, what are you most excited about in the year ahead? Besides the expedition, obviously super exciting, but what what, what are you stoked about? I'm just excited to see the footage that's going to be coming out of the dives that we do this year. I mean, we're going to be doing the first deep sea exploration of a Southern Ocean can submarine canyon. So essentially what that means is we're going to be looking at these areas that haven't been looked at before and we anticipate seeing some incredible stuff. So, you know, I literally stay glued to my the Schmidt Ocean YouTube page and watch these videos. My son is used to like that's the only screen time he gets. So he watches all the dives with me and um it's kind of a special moment for us. So I'm really excited for some for some dives coming up in the near future. That's amazing. That's so cool. I'm excited to watch too. And hopefully we can share that out with everyone else who's tuning in. Um, anything else that you want to share with, with the world or at least our listeners? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, 
There's so much to learn about the ocean. Please follow schmidocean.org. Check out our website. Follow us on social. We constantly have new content and material. We advertise when those dives are taking place so anyone can watch them. Or if you don't have a cool eight hours to sit and watch uh, deep sea videos, we can bring you the two minute highlights in 4K. So, you know, your choice. Not bad. I, I'd argue that the, the eight hour version is good for all of us to just slow down, right? The pace slows down underneath the ocean. It really does. It, it just kind of, you know, from my experience diving, you get much more slow and you just kind of absorb it and it's nice. So maybe we all should just tune into the eight hour version and, you know, it's one long take. That sounds great. <laughs> cool. Well, Carly, thanks for being here and thanks for all the incredible work that you and your team of scientists are doing. It's been a pleasure and we're excited to see you know what you do this year. Thank you so much for having us. And remember, next time you're out on the ocean surfing and you're at the surface of the water, don't just think about that next set coming. Think about what's beneath you and deeper. I love it. Thanks, Carly. Thanks. That was super cool, right? <laughs> Sorry for saying super cool so many times, but I really love this episode. I hope you learned a thing or two and I hope you're stoked on the deep sea please go check out the show notes and see some of the stuff we mentioned in this episode and be sure to follow Schmidt Ocean. That's at S-C-H-M-I-D-T Ocean to see what they're up to. They do really important research that helps inform all of us out here trying to protect the ocean. So thank you to all the scientists spending months at sea for this work. And thanks again to Carly for taking the time to share with us. And thank you for listening. If some of this blew your mind, be sure to share it with a friend or leave us a review. Find us online at WSL Pure or email us at oneocean at WSLPure.org. And uh, until next time, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>